Good evening, everybody, and uh, I'm honored to be able to speak in front of this auditorium tonight. Uh, thank you to my friend uh, Roger Hammock, who introduced me in this uh, Critic in Residence pro program. And uh, so, as you see, I have uh, no paper, no laptop, no PowerPoint, because I like to improvise and I like to provoke. And so that's why usually when I'm invited to talk, unless there is a really scientific uh, congress or conference where you, one has to quote and uh, uh, give uh, lit uh, reference from literature, I prefer speaking freely. And uh, besides, I like to make a long story short and uh, what I love the most is that the present uh, auditorium, the persons in the hall, give me uh, or ask, ask questions and then, then we can develop a debate, uh, discussion or confront different ideas, different points of view. So, uh, as you've heard, uh, I, I was asked to give a title to my presentation, my paper, you call it whatever you want, how to be, and so I have chosen this, how to be the system when there's no system. So uh, this needs a, little, a small, a short explanation. Uh, when I use the word system, I mean the art system. What is the art system or system of the arts? Uh, some maybe 20 years ago, the famous Italian art critic, uh, Achille Bonito Oliva, ABO, or ABO, as he's called, wrote a book with this title, Il Sistema dell'Arte, The System of the Arts. So in this book, he explains how the art world is functioning. And this uh, various functions and connections between them, he called them the art system, il sistema dell'arte. And the backbone of the art system, according to him, is the network of uh, private galleries. The private galleries have their clients, have their sponsors, have their big collectors, and they represent artists, as you know, what's going on in the most part of, in, in, of the world. So, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, what was going on uh, in Europe in the, without underestimating thank you, in Europe in the other, uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, but there was a big boom in the art market in Europe in 1980s. And uh, one of the groups that was uh, uh, the most attractive and uh, uh, was selling their uh, artworks for the highest prices was the Italian trans avant-garde. And there were other groups uh, simultaneously in the 1980s uh, in Germany, as they were called, the Neue Wilde, uh, the New Wild Ones, or uh, Figuration Libre in France, and uh, many others. So new image painting and things like that, uh, notions that are probably familiar, uh, that you are familiar with. So Achille Bonito Oliva was one of the, ma uh, the main promoters of the Italian trans avant-garde, which can be reduced to five names. This is Cookie, Chia, Clemente, Palladino, and De Maria. So he found these five young artists at the time and started writing about them, starting to organizing their exhibitions, and so on. And one of his friends was the famous Italian and international art dealer, Gian Enzo Sperone, who had a gallery in Torino, Turin, in Italy. And so he convinced Gian Enzo Sperone to organize the exhibition of the five guys in his gallery. But what is important, one of the main clients collectors that were buying from Sperona's gallery was Gianni Agnelli. Gianni Agnelli was the big boss, the owner of the Fiat car 
production factory. And of course, Sperone convinced Agnelli to start buying works by uh, Cucchia, Clemente, Paladino, and De Maria. But in Italy, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, popular press, yellow press, or whatever you call it. And uh, when uh, a person like Gianni Agnelli, which was, who was a real national legend in Italy at his time, uh, buys a work of art, all the Italian newspapers and other media uh, note that and uh, publish the articles that how oh, Agnelli bought the work of that and that emerging artist. And so uh, uh, you can imagine a big firm, a big company like uh, Agnelli's Fiat in Turin, and you can imagine that in every small town uh, in Italy there are people who run small businesses, uh, maybe with 10 or maximum 20 workers, but they all dream to become once so big, so rich and so important uh, as Gianni Agnelli was. So if they cannot afford a painting which was selling at that time for millions of liras, many millions, they can afford a print or a drawing or a watercolor. So, but and so as they said, Agnelli bought the works of these artists, so he must be right. And so we will buy the the works for the amount we can afford. And so the demand was getting stronger and stronger, and the prices were going up for a certain time. And it was the same thing happening with the artists of the same generation in uh, other countries, and especially at auctions and uh, in uh, art fairs, that. Uh, their paintings were uh, sold and resold. I witnessed myself at the art fair in uh, Milano, Italy, when the same painting, this one single day, was bought and resold three times. So this all led to the uh, saturation of market, and then the, the market went down. So this is one of the aspects of the art system. So uh, from that point of view, if we go further back in the history of art, we will see that the history of modern art was mostly made by dealers and their collectors, not by art historians and critics. And uh, if we take some great names. Uh, Picasso, I guess, would never be so famous without his two most important dealers, as uh, they were Daniel Henri Canveller, or Canveller, as the French pronounce it, and Ambroise Vollard. And not to speak about American pop art, if there were no Sidney Janis, Leo Costelli, and Elena Zonabant, and later on some others, uh, I seriously doubt if uh, the pop generation with uh, Andy Warhol as the head of that generation, or the best known artist, would be so searched and uh, uh, got so high prices. So, these are some aspects that create the atmosphere, that create the, uh, and support the system of art. And of course, as every system and uh, every event, it has ups and downs. So there uh, is a time for conjuncture, and there's a time of crisis. And uh, approximately every 10 or 15 or maybe 20 years, when the prices reach the climax, they start falling down, and many galleries close, and many uh, many dealers uh, go into bankruptcy, and so on. But after a few years, we are back to the revival. So why this introduction? And 
why the title of my presentation, as I told you. I was born and educated in a country that does not exist anymore. I didn't uh, move, I didn't uh, immigrate, I still live in the same place, but the country is different. So the, my country uh, was until 1991, I was born in 1953, was Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was a very particular country. Uh, for most uh, Westerners, it was a country of the so-called Eastern Bloc. It was a communist country. And uh, when uh, people in the West got some information from the so-called Eastern Bloc countries, communist countries, they said, oh, well, there's a dictatorship, there's a repression, and uh, people are not uh, allowed to speak freely, they don't have access to information and things like that. Well, that was not the case of Yugoslavia. It is true, we had one party system and that unique party was the Communist Party. But uh, we lived totally in, in totally different way, on totally different level than the people of, uh, uh, in, uh, in Poland or Czechoslovakia or Hungary or Romania or Bulgaria and of course Soviet Union. Uh, the historical background of this difference is then already in 1948 the Yugoslav president Tito cut with the Stalin uh, ideology in uh, Soviet Union because he didn't want to subordinate to Stalin. But it, this has uh, even older uh, roots. Uh, when the World War II was approaching to the end, uh, Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt met in Yalta. And in that famous Yalta conference, they were discussing how to divide Europe, how to divide influences uh, after uh, they beat uh, the Nazis. And so, so they decided that the greater part of Western Europe will become under uh, American influence and uh, so-called Eastern Europe under Soviet influence. And the system will be in the European country, the Western European countries, which will be the uh, uh, multi-party uh, democratic system, parliamentary system, while in the eastern part of Europe there will, there will be one party system, more or less uh, dictatorship. But it exists as a written document, just a small piece of paper, when the three big politicians, that is Sir Winston Churchill, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Josip Vissarionovich Stalin came to the point of Yugoslavia. And it was a problem how to divide Yugoslavia. And <clears throat> on that small piece of paper, Winston Churchill has written 50-50. He gave the paper, the piece of paper to to other guys, and they both agree. So Yugoslavia was something in between the Western parliamentary system and the uh, uh, Soviet type of, uh, of one-party system. And, uh, and that became even more evident when in 1948 Tito cut the links with Stalin. They were on the edge of a new war, but fortunately there was no war. And so Yugoslavia chose the third way. And uh, we, as citizens of Yugoslavia, were free to travel. The Yugoslavian passport 
was accepted and permitted us to enter over 150 countries in the world without a visa, be it in the Western world, be it in the so-called third world, Africa, Asia, and so on. And this was going on. And uh, of course, uh, we had access to international press, to books in whatever language we wanted to, uh, in whichever field we wanted. There were only a few restrictions, and these restrictions were uh, it was not allowed to bring in the country uh, the literature, the books, or the newspapers that were published by political immigrants. And political immigrants from Yugoslavia, they were mostly the uh, Quislings, the uh, people who belonged to groups that were fighting with occupation forces with uh, the Nazis and Italian occupants against the resistance, against Tito's partisans. That was forbidden, and for, it was forbidden to say anything against Tito and his government. So, if you kept uh, to this rule, the basic rule, you could do anything, you could travel, you can study, you can uh, also discuss philosophical problems which, are, which were not Marxist, uh, which were either classical or existentialist, and later on stru structuralist, and so. And uh, this special status was an advantage. But on the other side, uh, you probably know that in the countries of Soviet bloc, there was no private property and uh, the businesses and all other properties were a part of the state, were state-owned state and state government. In Yugoslavia, it was not so. Uh, we had so-called self-management, and the businesses, the companies, the firms, the factories belonged to the workers. So uh, every company had so-called uh, workers' council, and they decided about the business decisions and how to work and how to distribute the, the profit. Uh, the schools were f free, the medical care was free, and uh, everybody could study, and uh, everybody was protected, everybody had an apartment, and everybody could travel, as I've already told you. But as there were no private businesses in that sense, of course, they were not private galleries as well. If we return to our thing, to our subjects, what uh, we are, as art historians and art critics, uh, supposed to treat, supposed to, to discuss. So the artists could not sell they didn't have their dealers, they didn't have the galleries who would represent them. But in a way, they were also privileged. Because in that system, if somebody was an artist, not only painter or sculptor or uh, any connect with so-called Beaux-Arts, visual arts, but also writers, authors, uh, even critics, they could apply at the Ministry of Culture to have their social contributions covered by the state, by the government. So uh, social insurance and health insurance. It was paid and it is still practiced now, even 26 years after the dissolution in Yugoslavia, in what is nowadays Slovenia, where I come from, this still exists. There's a strong uh, pressure from European Union to cancel this because in the other uh, countries, members of the European Union, this does not exist. But it is, a, in a way, it is a Soviet heritage. But most artists have their uh, uh, social uh, contribution paid by the government. And uh, as I said, There were no 
private galleries who would promote artists and sell the work. Uh, there were other ways for the artists to survive. Most of them were teaching. Every primary school had uh, so-called visual arts education, and many of the artists, after graduating from art academies, were employed as art teachers in primary schools, and also in secondary schools or high schools as well. Uh, there were so-called uh, houses of culture where the courses, the lessons were given for amateurs or for everybody interested in fine arts. So the artists were teaching there as well. And step by step, since 1950s, 1954 or 56, the firms and the companies were encouraged to make their own art collections. So uh, a lot of my colleagues, which are a bit older than I am, were asked to select the works, uh, the artworks for the collections of various businesses, companies, uh, banks, and, and so on. And some of them have uh, very important collections. But there's a catch. In, as Yugoslavia consisted of six federal units, which had uh, quite a high level of autonomy and independence, uh, every one of these federal units was focused on the art production on their territory. So in Slovenia, 95% of collections, be it the corporate collections in the companies, be it the collections in the museums, are national. And that means that only Slovenian artists are presented there. There are, no, there are practically no international collections. And uh, this is one of the reasons that the artists from Slovenia are not known outside the national borders. Because, as you all know, uh, art market and uh, art system in general is a two-way street. So unless, for example, a German, American, Canadian, Japanese, Chinese artist will enter a public collection in Slovenia, there are very few chances that uh, the international uh, world uh, art world or museums would be interested in buying works by Slovenian artists. But there's always a solution for it. So a lot of uh, Slovenian artists went for a shorter or longer period in some Western countries. They found their dealers there, they found their galleries, and some became even famous. And uh, probably the most famous uh, Slovenian artist uh, uh, of the 20th century is Zoran Mušić. He was born in Slo by Slovenian parents at the time when this uh, land was still part of Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was born in 1909 and then he studied in Zagreb in Croatia. And uh, then during World War II, he, uh, he was uh, in the uh, Dachau concentration, Nazi concentration camp, camp, but he survived. And then he, when he returned from the concentration camp after the war, he moved to Venice. And he made a career in Venice in Italy and uh, very soon also in Paris, France. And he had some important, really important galleries who supported them, him. And, uh, and the effect is uh, that the, the Italians consider him an Italian artist and the French consider him a French artist. And, uh, 
besides so he died in 2005 but in the 1990s he was the first living artist who had a one man show in Grand Palais in Paris because Grand Palais has this big, big beautiful exhibition space the Galerie Nationale du Grand Palais uh, only showed uh, dead artists or artists from past centuries but he was still alive when he had this exhibition and curated by a well-known curator and uh, uh, who was among other things uh, also for years director of the Picasso Museum in, in Paris, Jean Clerc. So Jean Clerc was the chief cura the curator of the Mushit show and so, and so on. So this one aspect. The other aspect, uh, well, just uh, maybe to add, there were other artists from other parts of Yugoslavia, especially from Serbia, who went to Paris and made their careers there. One of them is, for example, uh, Vladimir Veličković. I wrote about him. I organized a few exhibitions of his work. He was uh, an architect by education. But he became so famous in France that uh, he finished his career as professor at the Paris Academy of Fine Arts, uh, Ecole Nationale des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Now he's retired and uh, he lives between Belgrade and Paris. The other uh, artist which is uh, quite famous uh, in France and in some other countries is Dado Djuric, originally from Montenegro, but he was, what is worth saying, the first artist from the ter ter territory of former, <coughs> sorry, of the former Yugoslavia that entered the permanent collection of the Pompidou Center in Paris. So there are quite some names, and not to speak about the celebrated <laughs> uh, Marina Abramovic. Uh, who now is a world famous uh, artist, uh, the grandma of performance art, as she's being called. She's originally from Belgrade, and uh, I remember her beginnings because at that time uh, uh, art critics and historians uh, were traveling all around, and so I was, I was several, several times invited to Belgrade, to Sarajevo, to Skopje, and to other places in. Uh, Yugoslavia to participate at panel discussions, to give lectures, or there were uh, common exhibitions curated by uh, curators from uh, various uh, federal units of Yugoslavia and so on. So I, I know Marina Abramovic from the late 1960s and early 1970s. So that's something that uh, can be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, what I wanted to say specifically about the art in Slovenia, we were always uh, late. We were always behind the events that were going on in Europe and in the Western world in general. So uh, the consecrated art artists in, Slo uh, in Slovenian art are the Slovenian Impressionists. They but they had their, their first exhibition 30 years after the Impressionism was inaugurated in Paris. So the French Impressionists exposed for the first time in 1874 in the studio of the photog photographer Nadar the first exhibition of Slovenian Impressionists took place in Vienna in 1904. Uh, and uh, of course, for uh, the general public and also the a part of intellectuals who quite strongly attacked their work. So can you imagine, 30 years uh, after the inaugur inauguration of the uh, international uh, or French Impressionism, there were still people considering uh, 
impressionist way of painting as something that is decadent or that has nothing to do with art. But step by step, they became uh, quite famous. And uh, uh, when the art market, step by step, also developed in Slovenia, they were the most demanded artists by Slovenian collectors. Uh, then there was a long uh, break until the 1920s, late 1920s, when an artist from Slovenia went to Bauhaus in Weimar. He spent there only a few months, but he returned with all these uh, avant-garde ideas, and he organized an exhibition of constructivism or Bauhaus-type art in a secondary school in Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia. And the uh, critics of that time, which were more or less uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic priests, or uh, at least uh, strong believers, attacked him and as decadent, as someone who is destroying the tradition of uh, what is considered real art, important art. So the poor guy had to escape, literally, and he moved to Trieste, Italy, the, the famous uh, cosmopolitan city of Trieste, which was the main port of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and uh, where there was a mixed population, Italians, Slovenians, Croats, Serbs, Greeks, Armenians, Jews. So, and uh, there he found the, the uh, Trieste constructivist group. And he was recognized only, it was in 1920s or early 1930s, he was recognized only in the 1960s in his native country. Uh, by the way, uh, from, you, you know that uh, Leo Costelli, the legendary art dealer, he's originally from Trieste. And uh, <clears throat> well, he, he's, he entered the art business quite late, to, when he was over 50. And uh, uh, there's a biography of Leo Costelli that was written by a French journalist uh, maybe eight or 10 years ago. And uh, 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 <clears throat> Leo Costelli remembered when he was going to primary school in Trieste that uh, some of his uh, uh, companions in the class were, were Slovenians. And in 1922, the fascists uh, put the Slovenian uh, uh, National Center onto fire and uh, Castelli also remembered that and quotes that and that's a biography and so on. But anyway, that's, that's just a, an anecdote. So, if we're going on, in the 1950s, and especially in the late 1940s, uh, uh, there was, uh, before, before the Tito's cut with Stalin, there was quite a doctrinary uh, or kind of command to the artists to paint in the mood or in style of socialist realism. So celebrating the workers, the peasants, and, uh, uh, and in the paintings or murals from that time, you can see happy workers, strong men and women uh, building the new country after the war and things like that. But some of these paintings, from the formal point of view, are perfect. The, the subject, of course, it's uh, ideologic. But when you take the painting as a painting, they are uh, really well done. Uh, they were done by real professionals, real artists. They, they knew what they were doing. But soon after, already in the early 1950s, the first signs of, uh, let's say, heresy uh, from socialist realism showed up. And, uh, and that was the beginning of abstract 
art, uh, abstract uh, art, abstract uh, painting in uh, on the territory of the Yugoslav uh, state. So one of these groups that uh, got together was called EXAT, E-X-A-T, uh, 51. And it was uh, short for experimental atelier, experimental studio. And they were, art, uh, they were painters, sculptors, uh, architects, and uh, designers, mostly graphic designers. And uh, their orientation was more or less geometric. And one of them, who was a very good friend of mine for over 30 years, and I have wrote, written several times about him and organized a few exhibitions, and even after his death in 2011, there were two exhibitions that I was invited to write essays for the catalogs, it was Ivan Pitzel. Ivan Pitzel was one of the rare artists from former Yugoslavia that never left the country. He was living in Zagreb, Croatia, but he, you will find his name in nearly all the encyclopedias or surveys of uh, modern art, art after World War II. And he was lucky enough that uh, coincidentally he was invited to Paris by a group of uh, French engineers that were doing some research in uh, Croatia. And he was also introduced to Denise René Gallery. And you know Denise René is a legend. Well, she died not so long ago in the age uh, of 99. And uh, she was the, the one who created Vasarelli. And she was defending uh, geometric art, neo-constructivist art, synthetic art, and so. And uh, Pitzer perfectly entered uh, uh, the concept of her gallery. Uh, Denise René founded uh, her gallery immediately after the liberation of Paris in 1944. And in the first years, she hesitated. Uh, she had some uh, uh, affection for uh, Surrealist art, uh, especially Man Ray and Yves Tanguy and so, even Miro, but soon she oriented herself to geometric abstraction and she insisted uh, on that orientation till her death because uh, in the 1960s the geometric, geometric, geometric tendencies were quite popular. And uh, among the artists in Denise René Gallery, there were uh, Scandinavian, South Americans, like okay, Mortensen or uh, 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 Jakobsen from Scandinavia. And then came the South Americans like uh, uh, Jesus Rafael Soto and uh, Carlos Cruz Diaz. And of course, one of her favorites was Victor Vazarelli, who was Hungarian by origin. And uh, also through this Croatian artist, Ivan Pitzel, I had the chance and honor to meet uh, Denise René in person. And I made two interviews, two long interviews with her for Slovenian media. And also uh, uh, I met most of still living artists uh, that she represented. I met with Soto, I met uh, several times uh, with Carlos Cruz Diaz. Soto died, uh, but uh, Carlos Cruz Diaz is still alive, and Joel Stein as well. And uh, so it was uh, for me as a young art historian quite an experience to be able to speak and to meet personally and have dinners and lunches with people who are already legends in the history of modern art. So that was, that was nice. But let's return back to the uh, situation specifically in Slovenia. So I was speaking about this uh, delay, this uh, art tendencies, trends, schools, movements, whatever you call them, 
uh, that came to our land uh, with uh, 10 or 20 years uh, delay uh, in comparison to what was happening in the Western countries. Uh, but step by step, we were approaching uh, the, the international art system and uh, not being delayed anymore. And this happened in the late 1960s with conceptual art. Uh, in Slovenia, there was a group called OHO, O H O, which is combined with UHO, which means ear, and OKO, eye. So eye and ear together, and OHO, O H O, and it was the name of a conceptual artist group who independently what was going on, they were not copying anyone, they were not following any trend in, I don't know, France or United States or wherever, but they were doing simultaneously more or less the same research. And, they were, and that was one of the reasons that they were invited to participate at the famous information show, as it was the name of the, the exhibition uh, organized by Museum of Modern Art in New York. And since then, there's practically no delay. There's practically uh, no uh, 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 artists from our territory are not following the trends in the world uh, metropolis and, uh, and uh, capitals. And uh, they are doing their work simultaneously. Well, the question that remains is how to survive. How to survive in this system? I already told you, they have certain benefits that the government covers their social insurance and uh, health insurance. But the artists are usually uh, supposed to sell their works. So step by step, they are finding collectors. And uh, uh, as I said before, uh, in the very beginning, the backbone of the art system and the art market are the private galleries. Till 1970, there were no private galleries or no commercial galleries at all on our territory. The first commercial galleries opened in, uh, as part of some publishing houses. And you can imagine that uh, uh, in the interest of publishing houses that print books is to sell prints, also graphic prints. Well, we have one big advantage, and that is the Ljubljana Print Biennial uh, that was founded in 1955. And uh, I remember when I was going around the world uh, visiting artists and galleries and museums, whenever I was introduced to someone and I told them that I was coming from Ljubljana or from Slovenia, oh, they said, oh, you have uh, the print biennial. It became so famous and uh, Many, many of important uh, artists won the prize at the Ljubljana Biennial, and many of important critics were invited to participate in the jury of the Biennial. Among others, just to quote properly, the best known one was the famous French critic Pierre Estany, who was a member of the Ljubljana Biennial uh, jury several times. And what is curious and what very few people know, Robert Rauschenberg was in fact discovered in Ljubljana because he won the grand prize of the Ljubljana uh, print biennial in 1963. And in, only in 1964, she, he was awarded 
at Venice Biennial, thanks to Leo Castelli, who organized uh, uh, everything, arranged everything uh, in a very corruptive way that uh, Bob uh, Rauschenberg is awarded in Venice. The works of uh, Rauschenberg were shipped to Venice uh, by United States Air Force. Military airplanes of the United States Army shipped the works from New York to Aviano in uh, northern Italy, where there's a very strong, till now, uh, uh, NATO or US military base. And from Aviano, they were transported to the lagoon and then by boats to the uh, uh, biennial, to the venues of Venice Biennial. And Leo Costelli was working so hard to convince the jury to give the great prize to, to Robert Rauschenberg because the actual jury, jury was against. But with the help of his friends in Rome and some guys uh, from American embassy in Rome, and of course with the uh, hidden support of CIA, he, he managed, <laughs> finally, that Rauschenberg won the prize at the Venice Biennial. So that's how the things go. One is the, yeah. That's one of the less known aspects of art history, art criticism, arts, the functioning of art system. So, and so now I return to my subject. So until the 1970s, there were no commercial galleries in Slovenia. So there were these galleries operated or uh, founded and also financed by publishing houses. And uh, the artists were selling more or less undercover. So no tax paid, uh, no control of the revenues directly to collectors or to art lovers in general. It was only in the late 1970s, uh, you know, the Yugoslavia got a new constitution in 1974, which allowed a more free uh, private initiative and private business. So one of the possibilities was to create is this uh, terminology is so specific for the Yugoslav system, uh, the so-called permanent working community of visual artists. So a group of artists gathered and they fulfilled all the papers and they had the right to organize exhibitions and to sell their work without declaring any income. So this was functioning. It started in the apartment of two of my friends, colleagues. One died last year, unfortunately. The other one is still alive. In their small apartment, it was the Siege Social of this company. And, but today, they have one of the most beautiful exhibition spaces in Ljubljana. It's called Ekugna, which is quite a strange name, but you know Ljubljana was settled even in uh, pre-antique times. And there are swamps there. Uh, and uh, the, there was uh, some people living there. They made uh, their houses, of the wooden houses, on the swamps, you know, on the trees, like, like, like Venice is built, you know. And, uh, and they were worshiping the goddess Ekwugna, it was the goddess of those swamps and so. And later on, of course, came the Romans and uh, there was quite a strong Roman settlement in Ljubljana. It was called Emona and still exists. Now, actually, they are rebuilding the canalization system and uh, two weeks ago, they found a, a Roman graveyard with sarcophags and things like that. So whenever somebody starts digging in the town, something comes out <laughs> from the ancient times and so so, that's, so that was one of the ways how the system step by step became, uh, uh, began to function. 
And uh, today, besides the official Fine Arts Academy in Ljubljana, which is part of the Ljubljana University, the university was founded in 1919, after the dissolution of uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and uh, they, there are a lot of other art schools, uh, private, semi-private, with license or so. So we have an enormous production of artists and uh, the quality of the work they are producing varies a lot. So sometimes I'm rather cynical and I say, we live in the times when we have an enormous quantity, a great number of artists, but very few, are very little art. So that's not just the case in my country. I can say this can be said globally. So everybody who has uh, five minutes of spare time wants to be an artist. So, but these artists have to survive, have to beat the system. Well, uh, as there were no galleries, but the artists survived. Now, in Slovenia, actually, Slovenia has only two million inhabitants. And when you drive a car across the country from extreme southwest to extreme northeast, it takes approximately three, three and a half hours maximum. So in that country, officially, the members of the Artists' Association are about 900. And new and new coming up. It's even worse with the architects. You know, the profession of architect is considered to be fancy, you know. They, they draw buildings, they are constructing. Yes, but it's very difficult to get a job and especially to get decent payment for it. So in Slovenia, with two million inhabitants, there are 4,000 architects. And every year from the Faculty of Architecture, in Ljubljana, 80, approximately between 60 and 80 new graduates come. Uh, just to compare, France has 66 million inhabitants, so 33 times more than Slovenia, but they have only 27,000 architects. So you can imagine how hard it is to survive, but they manage to survive in a way. And there's another problem with uh, the architects in Slovenia, uh, when they enter the faculty, the first thing they hear is the definition, architecture is the art of constructing space. So they, have, they, they forget all the other words, they just uh, keep the word art. Aha, uh -huh. the art of constructing space. Also we are artists, we can do whatever we want. And the second thing they hear is the name of the architect I mentioned before, Jože Plečnik, the famous Jože Plečnik, uh, who gave the image of the actual Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia. And the students are told Plečnik is the biggest, the most important Slovenian architect. He died in 1958. So whatever you do, no matter how good you are, you will never overcome Plechnik. So why all the Slovenian architects are frustrated? You know, they, they know their work, their efforts uh, have no use because they will never be so great as Plechnik is. So that's, there are some contradictions uh, in Slovenian cultural life in general, but so I don't make this uh, difference between painters, sculptors, architects, uh, designers, and so. I don't know. I've been speaking quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.